good evening, co colleagues, friends everywhere. And uh, we say also good morning to colleagues in USA and uh, welcome to our series of uh, virtual meeting. This is Gulf Intervention Society Curriculum 200, 2021 with uh, Sky. We have four great speakers and two great moderators. I'll introduce the moderators, then they will handle each uh, speaker and topics uh, one by one. So we have uh, my colleague Khaled Asani from uh, Ben Thani from Bahrain. He's an intervention cardiologist, also a board member of the Gulf Intervention Society. And also Dr. Adil Riyami from Oman, Qabus University, also intervention cardiologist, also founder of the Gulf Intervention Society. So both of these uh, moderators are gonna uh, introduce the speakers, then they handle the questions that at the end we'll meet to discuss um, uh, any you know question from you. Please send your questions and your comments. We have uh, almost 400 registered for this meeting. So Dr. Khaled, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abdullah. Um, and uh, welcome everybody for this, uh, this third session of our curriculum, GIS curriculum. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Akiko uh, Mehara. Uh, She's gonna speak about the uh, essentials on selective tracts. Uh, Dr. Mehara, she is the director of the intravascular imaging core laboratory and OMRI core laboratory and the CR clinical trial center in the United States of America. She is an assistant professor of medicine at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. Uh, I would love now to welcome her to the, uh, to the platform and if she can share her screen and start uh, the lecture. Thank you so much. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so let's start. So let's start the case. This is 53 adult male and recent onset of the chest pain. And you recognize the proximal already is quite tight and some sort of the hedginess and some adulceration. And LED flow is low compared to the other artery. So that's a lot of suspicious of the very vulnerable plaque. And I was can answer what's happening here. And corresponding to this ulcer, I can see the nice plaque rupture in the proximal LED. Also the left domain, that's a cavity. And the proximal LED, this is really chunk of the mural thrombus. It's really ongoing thrombotic event. And this patient we treated last week, but this is a type of the case which patient may suddenly die outside the hospital if we don't treat on time. The next case was 50 years old male, and you can see the similar ulceration in the right coronary artery. The only difference compared to the first case is you can see the stent. And this patient having the cipher stent a long time ago. And we performed the OCT, and this is really typical plaque rupture. And you can see the plaque rupture, and you can see the lipidic plaque, and this is disrupted fibrous cap. The only difference compared to the first case was you can see the stent. And there is a stent here, and there is a stent here. And this is really in the stent, de developing the atherosclerosis and the causing the plaque rupture. And the third one is 58 year the male and smoker presenting STEMI. And you can see the meat LED is kind of a hazardous but intermediate region. And we perform the OCT, and you can recognize this is small amount of the platelet rich thrombus. And there is attenuation indicating the lipidic plaque, but on the top, that is very thick fibrous cap, and proximal distal is relatively normal. And actually, this is really typical so called plaque erosion. And compared to this type two, and it's quite different, and the rupture is typically occur in the big lipid rich plaque and disruption of the fibrous cap. On the other hand, erosion is typically a bit poor and cap is sick and due to the deficiency of the endothelium causing the thrombotic event. And the next case is the 81-year-old male, a female, and please recognize before looking at the imaging what's happening here. And you clearly understand this is severely calcified artery and very clear you can recognize the calcium. And we perform the OCT, and it is actually very clear, typical calcified nodule. And you look into here, this is more calcium I can see in the chunk of the, this material, and go to the proximal distal, you see the big type of the calcium, right? 
And the calcium inode is really the accumulation of the small calcium fragments. And we can recognize this fragment in the OCT. You can see here a small calcium. And if that is acute, typically we see the erupted calcium nodule. But if that is stable, most likely covered by a fibrous cap. The reason why there is so many attenuation is because of the fibrin inside of the calcium nodule. And the recognition is quite important because the treatment is quite different. And if we look into the patient who had the big calcium behind, such as more than 270, and prevalence of the calcified nodule is 43%. Even though we know the calcified nodule is rare in entire ACS. However, if you start seeing the very calcified region in angio, you have to expect underlying cause could be calcified nodule, which is not a rare phenomenon. Let's talk to the stable patient. This is a very diffuse LED, and we have almost no idea what the vessel size and where should we learn. Land. And then we did the IBIS and we measure. And actually, the answer is quite consistent. In the proximal LED, is 4.9. After the big diag, is 4.1. After the second diag, is 3.4. After the third diag, is 3.0. So you can see the consistent tapering of the vessel in the LED. And the vessel taper in the LED is more compared to the circular light coronary artery, typically 0.33 millimeter in 10 millimeter length, and most likely occur at the site of the side branch. And also we have to remember before imaging, vessel is going to be remodeling and sometimes positive and sometimes negative. It's very heterogeneous and it occur in the same vessel. And let's talking the stent hand optimization. If we look into the imaging, what is the most important parameter to predict the future event? In IBIS and OCD, answer is quite consistent. What is also, what is always important and strongest is minimum stent area. Additionally, edge disease or edge dissection is also important. However, as long as stent area is big enough, malaposition or tissue protrusion really doesn't matter. But what, what we have to remember is we are putting stent in the very atherosclerotic region. So we have the so-called predicted stent area. For example, if you put a three millimeter stent, your stent area could be seven millimeter square. That's so-called predicted stent area. And we measure right after the stenting, how it looks like the stent area and compare. Actually, the average is only 66%. So if we put the seven, three millimeter stent, our area should expect at 4.6 millimeter square. Therefore, we are putting stent in the atherosclerotic artery, not like the soft tube. Therefore, always they are more likely underexpanded compared to what expect is the reality. Therefore, what is important is recognition and preparation. And if not, we have to make work more. Sometimes MSA is difficult because of the small, disease, small vessel or diffuse disease. Therefore, we look into all different parameters again, and based on the adaptives, including 2,000 patients. In this cohort, actually, the IBAS guidance was well done, meaning the minimum stent area is 6.2. In this cohort, we did many sophisticated A, such as including the branch information and so-called HK model or linear tapering, everything together, only one which predicts the future event is actually MSA divided by vessel area. So let me explain a little bit more. So we have two different types of the MSA. This is same area, and you see the behind is not, it's very small artery. This is a big artery. So if you have the same area in these two, this is really underexpanded. And we look into those uh, late ratio, and then even the small artery, and their ratio is quite predictable, which is bad, which is good. So not only the stand area, please look into the outside, how big the vessel, and then compare to what has to be, that is the goal which we should try. And the calcium is the be most important to making the pro expansion, so we have to look into more. So this is a two different calcium by IBAS. And by the way, I had a lot of misunderstanding of the calcium for a long time, me, my life, because I thought this calcium is bad, but actually it's not. And when we look into the OCD, this calcium is actually thin calcium and easy to making the calcium fracture. On the other hand, this calcium is small, but it's very thick, 
this could be worse. So sickness of the calcium is very, very important. And we be develop the calcium score. And what is really important to predict the extent expansion is total amount of the calcium volume. Not just angle, not just sickness, length, all together, you have to imagine how much total volume of the calcium in the region, that's very important. And if we are all together, the score is four, this is pro expansion. And we develop the IVA score as well. And compared to the OCT, because we learn more, we include something more important things. One is circumferential calcium is very important. Compared to let's say 330 degrees of the calcium, circumferential calcium is very different because if you have non-calcium segment, you can make easily dissection, but if that is circumferential, you have to make the fracture, otherwise, and the expansion. And also the vessel diameter is important because if we start small vessel, we have very small space to make the larger. So we have to be more aggressive. But we did a big mistake. I'm going to show one our big mistake. So let me show this case. This is a non STEMI. And you see the concrete region is here. And I was go and then we did the balloon and we saw this is okay, good expansion. And then we put the stem and this is how it looks like. Oops, we are very sad. <laughs> What's happening is the concrete region is really good, but if you go to the distal segment, it's super, super under expanded. Oh my goodness. So that's really bad. And we look into again, why this happened? Because we really focus the concrete region. So we saw this is okay. But actually on the very edge, we didn't pay too much attention. And then after we recognize, we put the balloon into the distal segment and clearly this is under expanding. And then because of this, we perform the shockwave and afterwards we see the good expansion. So this is how it looks like at the end. You see the good expansion in the very under expanded segment after the shockwave and the non-compliant balloon. And this case, actually, there is a good calcium fracture. And how can we detect the calcium fracture? Is it, I recommend to look for the outside. Because before, because of the calcium, we couldn't see outside at all. But after the fracture, you start seeing the outside. That's indicating the calcium fracture. So the message was, we should not care only the region. We have to care entire segment. So that's important. Okay, let's go back a little bit. What is the most important to make the good stent expansion in the calcified region is really making the calcium fracture. And we look into about 140 cases having the only the balloon and stent. And except this pink, all of the fracture occur in the less than 0.5 millimeter calcium thickness. Therefore, if the thickness is less than more than 0.5, we really recommend something more such as shockwave or rotabulator or atherectomy. What about this case? You see very severe calcium and you see nice calcium fracture everywhere. So most of the people, if you see this picture, is very uh, present. Okay, I'm happy because I see the nice calcium fracture, but step back. What is important is really after the making fracture, you have to make the good stent expansion. So this case, there is a nice fracture, but the stent expansion is not well enough. Okay, so we have to expand more and how? Because you have the good fracture, we just have to bother more and stretching more. In such calcium is stretching well because already this portion was no calcium, this is really good. Other things, what is important, you can see the malaposition. And this type of malaposition never ever touching to the surface because this is on the top of the calcium, we cannot change the shape of the calcium. Therefore, as I said before, as long as stent expansion is good enough, that's good. This type of malabsorption, you should not care. But this is bad expansion, you have to care. This is a stent edge dissection. After the stent, we pull back from here. And let's look into together. So this is the very beginning. You see something, and we come back, and that's a blanch, and that's a stent edge. So let me show one more time, very distal, you see something and something here and proximal portion. So actually this is a little bit difficult, but this is very typical so for the interim hematoma. And I can show here, but we debate, the lumen is big, there is a hematoma, but it's super tiny. So let's leave it alone, that's our decision. But what's happening, nine days later, it's totally occluded. It's really, really bad. And 
this is again a mistake. Why? Because this is how it looks like the post stamp when we did the IDAS. And this is really at the end of the procedure after wire. And you can recognize this storage is slightly got worse. And this tiny difference we really have to detect because hematoma can develop very quickly. So if you miss, if you recognize you should do IBUS again or you should put stent because this is getting worse and worse very quickly. To answer that very important question more carefully, we look into like 12 years IBUS data and then we found 15 hematoma which was not treated causing an acute occlusion. And we found 46 hematoma without acute occlusion. And then what is the main difference is when we put the stent and we see the hematoma in the completely normal segment, such as our case, that's more likely causing the, some event. So that is really important. Okay, this is my last case to explain. And looks like very good expansion of the right coronary artery and OCD was performed. Looks good expansion and very good. And you see something here and something here. Again, Good expansion, good expansion. And the very end, you see something, and you see something more. So what's happening in this case so was very good expansion, but the very end, it was so-called stent deformation because of the gui guiding. And because of this, final stent area is getting smaller, it's very small. And also at the edge, we have the hematoma, and that's really important. Okay. So let's summarize. My message here today is really, I do think each operator should have one imaging, either IBUS or CT, to be used with confidence. And then find recognition of the necessity of the calcium preparation, or appropriate device size and the landing zone, and recognize and wisely react the complication. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mehara, for this great uh, presentation. The audience, they can use the platform uh, through Zoom to send their question. If you have any question uh, from our colleagues uh, in the um, panel, uh, if there are any question, uh, please go ahead. Uh, I have a question, uh, Dr. Mahera. How often, it, practically, in your, in your lab, do you do imaging for STEMI cases? Oh! To be honest, Colombia don't have so much STEMI, really. So, but if that's coming, we do IBIS, most likely. And if we are not sure where the color pick, we do the OCT. So how often? I think if uh, enough people to be there, we do. So I would say, um, but still this, I would say 50%. Regular case, we do 90% of the imaging. So STEMI is actually this, unfortunately. Oh, wow. But that's actually quite high. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Imaging for, for yeah. patients. Okay. okay. Um, I think uh, uh, we don't have any questions from the audience. Uh, uh, there, there is one question, uh, Khaled. Where? Uh, there you go. Okay. Uh, so uh, there is a question from Mr. Mann. Uh, great talk, thank you, he said. Uh, reverberation on IBIS, does that tell you anything uh, regarding the thickness of the calcium? Yeah, answer is yes, um, good question. And we thought so. So when we compared IBIS and OCT in about, let's say 400 patients, and then we see some pattern, meaning we see the nice reverberation by IBIS. Typically those cases when we look into OCT, it's seen calcium. And I try to understand why. And actually, this is not physics. The reason is when you have the thin calcium, most likely those thin calcium is not complex calcium, meaning start from the necrotic core, it's typically big, big, thick calcium. But when the calcium is thin, typically they are relatively simple calcium. And when the evaporation occurs is when the surface reflection is very high, meaning that when the surface is very smooth, we can get the evaporation. So my conclusion why, it's because of the same calcium is more likely having the chance having a smooth surface compared to the chunk of the calcium. That is the reason when we start seeing the nice reverberation before any treatment, that's more likely correlate with the same calcium. That's my understanding. 
So that's actually true. When you see the population before rotable enter anything, 70% of the time relatively thin. But my, uh, my concern is not always true. If you see the nice population, it's super thin. So sometimes opposite. So it's not one by one correlation. That's the reason I don't recommend too much to using this information for your prediction. But this is one important parameter which may help you. So that's my message. Um, the, the next question is, is from Dr. Mohammed al Mutairi from Kuwait, I think. And he says, do you need to stent all uh, intramural hematomas? No. But <laughs> <laughs> but that's difficult. And I could answer. I, I did the IBUS almost 20 years. And I couldn't answer. I wrote the IBUS hematoma paper almost like 20 years ago. And then that time, I really couldn't answer because it looks worse, but sometimes okay, sometimes not. And then to answer that question, I need 20 years to uh, picking up the many, many cases having the acute occlusion. And afterwards, 12 years, we picking up the 15 hematoma acute occlusion bus not. And then finally, if we put the stem uh, having the hematoma is completely normal, and because of the hemat, you, you, you have to stem. Because hematoma can develop distally or proximally if there is no branch or no atherosclerosis because media is so normal and easily to extend distally or proximally. So if your hematoma ending in the completely normal segment, I recommend to put the stem. And also what is important is entry site because hematoma is medial dissection and the entry site and that blood is in, uh, developed, uh, extended in the medial space, right? So if you're already closing the entry site because hematoma occur at the stent edge, we may already close by stent, just leaving the hematoma which was done before stent. So if already closing the entry site, it's okay, but it's not more likely bad. So two things, entry was covered and normal side. That's I think we should stand. Otherwise, our room is enough and that's may, may not. Nice. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mihara, for, uh, for answering the questions. And I think I will hand the microphone now to my colleague, Dr. Adel Riyami, to uh, present the next speaker. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mihara. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Elissa Alton is an assistant professor of medicine at Yale University School of Medicine, and she's going to talk to us about the use of IVUS in STEMI. Dr. Alton. Thank you so very much for the opportunity to speak with you all this evening. I have no relevant conflicts of interest to this talk. So we've all seen these episodes after primary PCI, where patients return with recurrent angina or recurrent ACS, and they have either long segment focal ISR or completely occluded stents. So the clinical problem here is how do we avoid this in primary PCI for ACS and STEMI? So what is the role of IVUS use in STEMI? It can help us to identify plaque rupture, as Dr. Mayahara showed us in great examples. It can help us to identify appropriate vessel sizing. It can help us to ensure that we have complete stent expansion post dilation. And it can help us to evaluate for residual stenosis and dissection following the case. True reference vessel diameter may be difficult to assess in STEMI. And this is due to general and localized vasoconstriction from the thrombus burden, from catecholamine stimulation, from the inflammatory substances, and from microvascular dysfunction downstream. So we'll start with rates of IVUS use. In a Medicare population from the United States, IVUS use is very low. So this study looked at Medicare patients from 2009 to 2017. And although there was a rise from 3% to almost 7%, um, the percent, only 7% of all PCIs are use, use IVUS. And this is in spite of the fact that IVUS use uh, results in lower mortality. What about in STEMI? So there is recent data from the National Inpatient Sample 
looking at trends from 2012 to 2017. So in a STEMI population from this sample, the rate of IVUS use is 4.2% compared to the 7.7% we saw in the Medicare population. And this is a snapshot year from the national inpatient sample of 2016 to 2017. Um, showing that the rates of IVUS use were slightly higher, 5.5%, again, probably picking up on the trend that we saw from the Medicare patients of all comers. And in this study, they showed that in patients who uh, had IVUS as part of their uh, STEMI procedure, they had a lower incidence of in-hospital death, in-hospital cabbage, and a higher likelihood of iatrogenic dissection and higher hospital costs. So the question for this talk is, can IVUS use in selected STEMIs decrease target lesion revascularization? So ISR rates are stable at about 10%. So this is uh, data from the NCDR CATH PCI registry uh, in the United States, showing that from 2009 to 2017, the overall rates of ISR have remained stable a little over 10%. Um, and this represents an unmet need in uh, improvement in our procedures. So going back to a 2008 paper from Jack Intervention by Vanderhoven, um, they identified predictors of stent malapposition and STEMI in the mission study. And they showed that predictors of stent malapposition are larger reference vessel diameter, lower maximum balloon pressure, um, which they suggest uh, means that the stents are underexpanded and longer stented segments. And in this study, they found uh, over a third of patients had acute stent malapposition after primary PCI. But as we heard from Dr. Mayahara, stent malapposition is not the story really. Um, stent malapposition may be a marker of stent underexpansion or small minimal stent area, but underexpansion and minimal stent area that is too small represent um, the most important predictor of ISR. Um, so this uh, figure is from um, a study from uh, Soita et al. looking at newer generation stents and OCT data showing that the rate of um, TLR is highest with uh, patients with irregular protrusion from the stent and a small minimal surface area. And multiple studies have shown that stent under expansion, not stent malapposition, independently predicts ISR. However, the big assumption here is that the stent is not underexpanded. Um, IVUS has been repeatedly shown to decrease target lesion revascularization in elective PCI. This is the most recent meta-analysis from JAHA last year, um, confirming the benefit of um, IVUS-guided versus conventional angiography-guided um, PCI for reduction in TLR. Uh, what about ACS? So from the ADAPT DES study, we know that IVUS guidance increased stent optimization and decreased stent thrombosis, target vessel, MI, and death rates. Um, this is the subgroup analysis force plot of MACE events in the IVUS versus angiography guided. Um, and in ACS patients and in stable ischemic heart disease, IVUS guidance was better in the subgroup analysis. Um, the ultimate trial looked at IVUS guidance in all comers and showed that IVUS reduced the rate of target vessel failure at three years from 10.7% in the angi angiography guided group to 6.6% in the IVUS guided group. And this is preserved at each year follow up. So the blue uh, bars are uh, one year, two year, and three year follow up in the angi angiography guided group, showing um, progressively incrementally higher rates of target vessel failure with each year. And in the IVUS guided groups, which are the red bars, you can see um, consistently decreased rates of target vessel failure at each year follow up. And looking at the subgroup analysis for target vessel failure at three years, those patients presenting with ACS um, had lower uh, rates of T TVF in the IVUS guided group compared to the angiography group. So what is known for IVUS and STEMI? Um, the short answer is not much. So from the Credo Kyoto AMI registry um, that was published in 2006, they showed no difference in MACE, including TLR, after adjusting for the confounders between the IVUS and angio guided groups. 
Um, but IVUS is likely better because um, it improves our stent sizing ability, it results in larger MSA and can ensure good outflow and inflow um, visualization. And what is worse is um, with IVUS use, we often use longer stents and more stents and overly aggressive ballooning and post dilation can lead to tissue protrusion or dissection. Um, so this summer was uh, recently published from the National Inpatient Sample um, Observational Administrative Data, um, a look at IVIS guided versus angio guided PCI and STEMI. And what they found was there were lower rates of readmission due to acute MI at six and 11 months and lower rates of repeat PCI and mortality at 11 months. So I'll review two cases for you. The first is a 62-year-old man, a truck driver, who has a current smoking history and heavy daily alcohol use. He presented with nausea and chest pain, and you can see um, profound ST elevations inferiorly. On diagnostic angiography, his left main was patent. His circumflex showed luminal disease. Uh, his LAD was proximally patent, and you see a long segment um, mid uh, after this diagonal branch um, that is straightened, it's more obvious in the cine film that it had the appearance of a bridge. And the culprit vessel was identified as the RCA in the mid segment with a thrombotic occlusion. A six French hockey stick guide was used to intubate the RCA. However, with intubation, the patient became bradycardic. Um, right common femoral vein uh, was accessed and a temporary pacing wire was placed. A run-through wire was advanced into the distal vessel and it was pre-dilated with a 2.5 by 15 millimeter balloon and IVUS was performed. So the IVUS findings um, showed a pretty big vessel. The distal reference area was 13.5 and the minimal and maximal diameters were four and 4.3. And the proximal reference was 13.4, minimal and maximal 3.9 and 4.4. So the size was a little surprising to my eye. Um, we placed a 3.5 by 32 uh, and a 4 by 16 millimeter drug eluting stents overlapping from distal to proximal vessels and post uh, di dilated with a 4 by 20 millimeter non compliant balloon. And uh, you can see on final angiogram um, good flow distally, some pruning uh, of the distal branches from the thrombus load, um, but overall a good result. And the final IVUS uh, showed uh, the distal stent area of 11.7 um, with the minimal and maximal diameters 3.8 and 4, and the proximal stent area was 10.9, well expanded. This is case number two, another active smoker, 52-year-old with hypertension and hyperlipidemia who presented with nausea and vomiting and abdominal pain that started five days prior to admission and four days of substernal non-radiating chest pain. You can see Q waves in uh, three and AVF and um, ST elevations in those leads with reciprocal depressions in uh, V5 and V6. On diagnostic angiography, there's a non dominant CERC with luminal irregularities. You can see the LAD is uh, mostly patent except for this uh, one segment that has a short segment disease. And you can see collaterals left to right filling the right. The culprit vessel was identified as the osteal right. A six French hockey stick guide was used to engage. And the lesion was crossed with a run through and a caravel support uh, catheter that was hydraulically removed. Um, and we pre dilated with a 2.5 by 15 balloon subsequently. And you can see this image after post dilation. And again, to my eye, this looks like a smaller vessel. Um, however, dominant rights often fool us in STEMI, and they're usually bigger than they look. So we performed IVUS for vessel sizing and the distal reference vessel was 3.5, which was longer than we expected based on its appearance, uh, excuse me, larger than expected. So we stented the prox mid RCA with a three by 38 millimeter drug eluting stent and post dilated with a 3.5 proximally and a 3.0 distally um, NC balloons. And following this, we had a good result in the stented segment, but you can see at the outflow, something's going on. Um, didn't have the complete appearance of a dissection, but we took the IVUS down to ensure that there wasn't. And what we did find was 
um, continued heavy disease and a good distal landing zone of three millimeters. So we overlapped with another stent, a three by 24 millimeter drug eluting stent and post dilated it um, with a three by 20 to high pressures um, with an excellent angiographic result. So the learning points from today, IVIS can help us in sizing vessels in AMI to um, avoid undersizing. Undersized stents predict ISR. Rates of IVIS use are overall low in the United States samples I presented to you, 7% of all interventions and 4% of STEMI interventions. IVIS can help differentiate disease from dissection and stent outflow. Vessel optimization in general leads to decreased TLR in elective PCI, although there's limited data in STEMI. And until further data is available, IVIS can be useful in selected STEMI cases. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, uh, Dr. Alton. That was, uh, was excellent. Um, clearly, there's no doubt that IVIS is helpful. But again, my question is, um, what makes you decide in a STEMI to pull out the IVIS catheter? Because if money was not an issue, uh, maybe time, I guess, uh, as well. But if money is not an issue, a lot of people who are going to use IVIS. Um, so a few things. I think one, when I'm unsure if I'm picking the right stent size, I don't want to undersize a, I don't want to undersize a vessel, um, particularly in RCA STEMIs, giving nitroglycerin to dilate and um, assess the true stent size can be, uh, can lead to precipitous drops in blood pressure. Um, so I think it is useful in that regard to make sure that we don't undersize. And then secondarily, case selection is important because there are certain patients who after, after pre-dilation um, will acutely close that vessel again and become very sick. So you're sort of pre-selecting the patients who are clinically stable enough to take the extra few minutes um, to run that IVUS catheter down and appropriately size based on that. Um, I wonder if Dr. Mayahara or Dr. Mintz have any comments relating to this? I think I completely agree. If I add, I think whenever you have some uncertain what's happening, that's a good time to start. Meaning like the, can we find any collectable issue within the stent or edge of the segment? Meaning many times in STEMI, slow flow, it's just due to the microvascular dysfunction, but sometimes you have the edge dissection that may causing the slow flow. So if you find collectible issue, that's making much better. So those are the time. I mean, yeah. I, I, th I think one thing Akiko mentioned briefly when you asked that question of her, was availability of personnel. Um, it's not so much when you should use IVIS because it almost always helps. It's when it's practically impossible to do. If you're doing a STEMI in the middle of the night, if, the, if your cath lab staff is skeleton, if they're not familiar with the equipment and you've got your hands full with the patient, um, very few people are going to reach for an IVIS or an OCT catheter. I mean, that's just just natural, uh, but that doesn't mean that it wouldn't help if you had the people in-house or if it was a STEMI during the daytime. Um, and I guess I'm going on a tangent now. Um, if you have a, uh, a STEMI, and we've seen this, where you become aggressive in post-dilation, and then you get a no reflow. So some, some people would, you know, put a reasonable size stent uh, and maybe not do the post dilatation uh, until 48 hours later. Not very practical, but uh, maybe it reduces the no reflow. Do you, is that something that you've seen or? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the, the difficulty is a prediction. But I think there is some important things, meaning the so-called attenuate plug. If we do the IBUS, we see the, a lot of attenuation without calcium, and that's indicating the lipidic plug. So if you have a lot of attenuation behind stent, and that's long, like the right coronary artery, the four vessel, and the overall amount of the necrotic core is huge. So if you are treating the large right coronary artery, long disease, and you see a lot of attenuation, that's more likely due to the plaque rupture, a lot of necrotic core, that's more likely causing worse, right? But on the other hand, like 30% is actually uh, plaque erosion. 
and plaque erosion don't have a lot of repeated plaque behind. And if you look into the behind, it's not much attended plaque repeat, you expand, it's almost uh, not, not having the slow flow. But issue as prediction is very difficult. Many people try to make some cutoff, but it's not difficult. It's it's not easy. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. The neg the negative predictive value is high. The positive predictive value is quite low. Vessels are dynamic. I mean, if you want to go on a farther tangent, if you open a CTO and you bring the patient back, the distal vessels are going to be larger. So right. people people are talking about. Uh, a deliberate strategy of bringing the patient back one to, I don't know, one to three months or something after opening the CTO and then re-imaging and then re-expanding the stent more appropriately for that vessel size. Um, you know, I mean, you just have to understand that vessels are very dynamic, particularly if the patient is sick. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Khaled? <clears throat> okay. Um... It's a great pleasure now to go next for the next uh, speaker uh, and the next uh, lecture. Um, uh, so delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Gary Mills. He is a senior medical advisor at the Cardiovascular Research Foundation in the US. Uh, and he is the course director of the TCT, the Transcatheter Cardiovascular um, and Therapeutics. Um, he gonna speak about state-of-the-art session and uh, please, uh, Dr. Pence, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, just give me one second. So thank you much for the invitation. When we treat patients in the cath lab, there are a number of clinical questions that arise on a daily, in fact, almost hourly basis and a number of modalities beyond angiography that can be used to answer them. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I'll pick and choose some that I think are most important. The first issue is assessing the severity of a non-left main lesion and deciding whether or not you should treat it. Randomized trials have established that intracoronary physiology is the technique of choice in deciding whether or not you should treat a non-left main lesion. We've tried for decades to come up with equivalent IVIS criteria. While the minimal lumen area is the most consistent in terms of correlating with ischemia, it ranges from four square millimeters to two square millimeters, and the positive predictive value averages about 50%. Sometimes a big lumen that on a secondary lesion will allow you to defer intervention, but you should never, ever, ever use intravascular imaging to justify treating a lesion. And OCT is no better. The main reason is because of the, the amount of myocardium subtended by a lesion or a vessel, irrespective of its location, is extremely variable, as is shown in this elegant study from Jeju uh, National University in Korea. You can see, for example, in the proximal LED location, the amount of myocardium subtended by a lesion that would be in the proximal LED. Now, the left main is, is different. And of all the coronary artery segments, the left main has the greatest angiographic inaccuracy and the greatest variability in assessment. For example, in this one study from 2007, the unanimous correct assessment of left main severity was only 29%. Here are two cases of osteo left main disease. And I ask you simply, which would you treat and which would you not treat? And it turns out you should not treat either of them. This is an angiographic artifact. And within the left main, the aorto-osteal junction is the lesion location that's least reliably assessed angiographically. Now, there are issues both with FFR and IVIS assessment of left main disease severity, and you have to be just aware of the technical and practical and theoretical issues. But there is more agreement between IVIS and FFR and left main disease than in non-left main disease. And this meta-analysis from 
um, uh, Javier Escaned's group showed that whether you use an FFR more than 0.8 or an IVIS lumen area in the left main of more than six, the event rate at follow-up is about the same and deferring left main intervention based on these criteria is safe. You've heard a little bit about acute coronary syndromes, but what most people don't realize is that as many as 50% of non-STEMI patients either have no identifiable culprit or have multiple potential culprits. OCT tends to be the technique of choice in deciding what is the culprit because it can identify thrombus and differentiate between white thrombus and red thrombus. It can detect plaque erosion. And in terms of uncommon causes of an acute coronary syndrome, both IVIS and OCT can detect a calcified nodule or spontaneous coronary artery dissection. This is a patient who presented with an acute coronary syndrome, a non-STEMI, two potential culprits in the LAD and the circumflex. The LAD has a clear plaque rupture, but no thrombus. The circumflex has a large amount of thrombus, but no obvious plaque rupture. But the circumflex is the culprit because of the presence of thrombus, while the plaque rupture in the LAD is probably old and stable. Why is this important? because we have known going back more than 15 years that if you have a culprit lesion with an intact fibrous cap, those patients do better than if they have plaque rupture. And this led to Francesco Prati postulating that in STEMI patients with an intact fibrous cap, they could be managed with thrombectomy and not necessarily require stent implantation. That led to studies in Harbin, China, called the erosion study, which followed a larger group of patients. And there were, in fact, a subgroup of patients with an erosion, that is an intact fibrous cap as the culprit lesion, who could be treated medically and who did well at one year of follow-up. I am not suggesting that that is what you should do, but this concept is under intense scrutiny and is worthy of um, following. In terms of calcified nodules, we have become acutely aware that these are difficult to treat lesions. And this is a study of acute coronary syndrome patients comparing calcified nodules to plaque rupture and plaque erosion. And notice that the ones with a calcified nodule that was responsible for the event had worse, had more events at follow-up. In terms of SCAD, spontaneous coronary artery dissection, when at all possible, these should be treated medically. And the simple reason is because they heal. Here's a patient with SCAD, and at six months follow-up, the OCT looks perfectly normal. Yes, these patients can have recurrent SCAD, but recurrent SCAD does not occur at the site of the first event, because the first event is, if you will, um, has the layers of the artery have become fused. Recurrent SCAD occurs at a different site. Akiko has already alluded to the predictors of DES, early stent thrombosis, restenosis, and clinical events. The number one predictor is stent under expansion, specifically the minimal stent area. The number two predictor is geographic miss or what happens at the stent edges. So the problem is stent optimization is not easy to achieve. In four studies, IVIS XPL, Ultimate, Illumium 3, and a meta-analysis from Yonsei in uh, Korea, it was possible to achieve pre-specified stent optimization criteria in only about half of the lesions, even using modern techniques. So we still need better approaches to optimize expansion and avoid geographic miss. Akiko has shown you these scoring systems. We have validated and published a scoring system for calcium uh, with OCT. And we have one in press for, um, for IVIS. And that has led to this algorithm, which I'm not going to go through in detail, how we address calcified plaque 
based upon recognizing the amount of calcium by OCT or IVIS or the morphology of calcium by OCT or IVIS that will predictably result in stent under expansion if these are not modified by, same, by some technique. We've also identified evolved into a universal strategy for stent sizing. Earlier data suggested that IVIS um, measured larger than OCT, but with modern HD IVIS, the difference between IVIS and OCT has become minimized. So that we have a universal stent sizing algorithm based upon sizing the stent to the distal vessel and sizing the post dilation balloon to the proximal vessel. And we always do IVIS after stent implantation when we've achieved what we believe is good angiographic results. And if the stent has not, is not optimized, we do more work. And this is an iterative process and that's the best way to achieve stent optimization. What about outcomes data? Well, as of um, about a year ago, I've not recently updated this. This is the data that is available comparing intravascular imaging to angiographic guided stent implantation, randomized trial studies, meta-analyses, and registries, an overwhelming amount of data. I'm gonna share with you just a little. This is one meta-analysis of 10 IVIS versus angio-guided DES implantation randomized clinical trials, showing that IVIS guidance was associated with a reduction in cardiac mortality, myocardial infarction, TLR, and stent thrombosis. And if we look at the two largest studies, IVIS XPL and Ultimate, which you've already heard about, the primary endpoint and intention to treat analysis from IVIS XPL showed a 50% reduction in events at 12 months. And if the stent is optimized, the event rate at one year is only 1.5%. Ultimate was a Chinese rather than a Korean study, but the results are almost identical. IVIS guidance was associated with a reduction in events by 47%. And if you achieve stent optimization, the event rate at one year follow-up is only was only 1.6% in um, Ultimate. We have five-year data from IVIS XPL and three-year data from um, ultimate showing that the benefits of IVIS are not only sustained, but seem to increase over time. And in a combined patient level data analysis from these two studies, you can see that IVIS guidance reduced mortality by 57%. And if you achieve stent optimization, the mortality is maybe 0.5% at three years of follow-up. The largest study comparing IVIS and OCT is Opinion, comes from Japan, showing identical events at follow-up, and a meta-analysis from David Capadana's group um, looking at IVIS, angiography, and OCT. You can see that both IVIS and OCT are better than angiography, and IVIS and OCT are about the same. Let's look at a couple of lesion subsets. First, the left main. This is the classic study by Su Jing Kong looking at predictors of events after left main stenting. And it came up with the, the um, algorithm of five, six, seven, eight, minimal stent area of eight in the left main, six in the ostium of the LAD, and five in the ostium of the circumflex. But the data from Excel suggests that these really should be larger in Western patients. Remember, the previous study was done in Korean patients. And Korean patients are have body surface areas of about uh, two thirds to three quarters, those of Western patients. And the cutoffs in IVIS XPL, sorry, sorry, in Excel, suggest a left main of nine, an LAD of seven, and a circumflex of about five and a half. Excel also identified the importance of stent deformation. Stent deformation in the left main is not uncommon after stenting the left main. We can talk about why it happens, but if you have stent deformation, the event rates double, even if the stent area is acceptable. In terms of left main data, this is a meta-analysis of 11 
left main DS studies, only two of which were randomized trials, but showing that there was a reduction in all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, stent thrombosis, MI, and target lesion vascularization with IVIS guided left main stenting. But more importantly is this study from uh, the UK. This is a national registry in which patients with left main stenting were with IVIS guidance were compared to those without, without IVIS guidance. And there was a national reduction in mortality of 34% if a patient had left main stenting that was IVIS guided compared to angiography guided. You heard an elegant talk about AMI. The largest database actually comes from Korea. It's called the CAMIR registry. It's an online registry of about 12,000 patients. 9,000 were angio guided, 2,000 were IVIS guided, and a small number were OCT guided. And whether you use IVIS or OCT guidance, you reduced patient-oriented cardiac events or device-oriented cardiac events primarily by reducing all-cause mortality or cardiac mortality. A lot could be said about CTO intervention. I'm not going to talk about the technique. This is an elegant review article by Fred Galassi and his colleagues. But let me just show you that um, a randomized trial from, from Korea showed a um, large reduction in events, a 65% reduction by intention to treat and a 74% reduction um, per protocol when CTO interventions were IVIS guided. And the last quick topic in terms of subsets are patients with contrast induced nephropathy. If a patient presents with chronic kidney disease and develops contrast induced nephropathy, the one year mortality is 25%. And it's related to the amount of contrast that you use. Better not to treat this patient than to put the, than to um, induce contrast induced nephropathy. How do you avoid this? You avoid it by not using contrast. Zero contrast PCI is not only a concept, it is a reality and is standard practice at our institutions. Now people sell, always ask me, well, how can IVIS reduce mortality? I understand that it'll reduce stent thrombosis. I understand that it'll reduce restenosis, but why mortality? Well, these studies summarize the mortality associated with stent thrombosis and its treatment or stent restenosis and its treatment. And it's not small. If you look at this one study here of 166 left main reinterventions, the five year mortality was 30%. That's why IVIS reduces mortality. The last topic I'll talk about briefly is the diagnosis of stent failure. The technique of choice is OCT, but if you don't use OCT, you should use IVIS and whether you have a bare metal stent or a drug looting stent, whether they present with stent thrombosis or restenosis. And when they present, you can get a differential diagnosis in your mind and then use imaging to narrow it down. I'm gonna to only touch on a couple of these. So um, this is uh, OCT showing different causes of stent restenosis. And this is OCT diagnosis of neoatherosclerosis. As Akiko mentioned, neoatherosclerosis is the development of atherosclerosis within a stent, and you can have lipidic neointima, neointimal rupture, neointimal rupture, and thrombus formation, red thrombus and white thrombus. Why is neoatherosclerosis important? Because once you develop neoatherosclerosis, stent failure is predictable as is shown in these three studies, one with angioscopy and two with OCT. And once you have to treat neoatherosclerosis as a cause of instant restenosis, the event rates that follow up are higher. Again, these uh, two studies, um, one from Japan and some data from CRF. We can also use imaging to determine the causes of stent failure. Uh, nobody quite knew why scaffolds failed until 
people started doing OCT at the time of, of scaffold failure. And you can see scaffold discon discontinuity where the scaffold collapses into the lumen. And even though people had hoped that scaffolds would be immune to neoatherosclerosis, this study from Japan shows that that is not the case. And in fact, scaffolds develop neoatherosclerosis with neoantimal rupture, just like drug eluding stents. I mentioned calcified nodules earlier. The mechanism of uh, instant restenosis with a calcified nodule is that the calcified nodule re-encroaches into the stent. It fractures the stent and it causes restenosis by um, narrowing the lumen. I'll quickly share with you a case. Um, a 45-year-old male with what risk factors, chronic renal failure on hemodialysis. Here is his right coronary lesion with a clear calcified nodule. He had a pretty good acute angiographic result. Two months later, he comes back and the calcified nodule is back inside the stent. He was treated with a drug code of balloon, pretty good angiographic result. Two months later, calcified nodule is back inside the lumen treated with another stent. So it's now stent within stent to treat a calcified nodule. One month later, it's back. So we can understand mechanisms of stent failure exquisitely using intravascular imaging, especially OCT. So this slide summarizes the clinical problems I mentioned and the various techniques available to use them. To echo what Akiko said, you need to be good at one of these, IVIS or OCT, because you can, you, you can answer 80 to 90% of your routine stent implantation questions and use these techniques to optimize your, your stents with I, either IVIS or OCT, because the number one issue is vessel size and then followed by um, uh, stent optimization. How do you make this all happen? Well, we've been a strong believer in a cath lab based imaging program going back to when CRF was in Washington at the Washington Hospital Center because dedicated personnel can become your partners in doing your PCI procedures. Very similar to what happens in an echo lab where the echo technicians actually are um, the diagnosticians. Thank you for your attention. Um. Thank you, Dr. Mintz, for this uh, great talk. Um, if we have any questions from the uh, panel, uh, please go ahead. Uh, I do have one question from the audience. Uh, it's from Dr. Ampleri. He says, um, any specific criteria for assisting osteolithomy? We touched base with this. Uh, well, I, I mean, you assess the ostium of the left main like any other part of the left main, but there's some technical issues that are very important. Um, you must disengage the guiding catheter because otherwise you'll think you'll have circumferential calcium and you must have the guiding catheter relatively coaxial so that you image the ostium um, perpen as perpendicularly as possible. Uh, most of the time, uh, the answer is obvious. It's not you know, we're not talking about 5.9 versus 6.1 square millimeters. So many of these are, are normal or are severely diseased. But if you have to pick a MLA criteria, it's like anywhere else in the left main, six square millimeters. Um, um, I have like, what do you call it? It's to touch base regarding the, the SCAD and the management of the SCAD because the medical management for the SCAD is, is well known now. Um, um, some of our colleagues, they are still using the VKA or the warfarin for these patients, and some they are using still the dual antiplatelet therapy. So, um, um, what's what's your thought about it? Yeah, I mean, there there's so little data, and even the um, the articles that are written by supposed experts on the field do not have any consensus. Um, I think there's nothing wrong with a short course of dual antiplatelet therapy, but you worry about it's being deleterious. I think the patient should be on beta blockers for sure. Um, and I think probably over the, you know, the, the, the early time frame, 
um, they should uh, avoid any kind of activity. Their blood pressures have to be vigorously controlled um, and looking for other, you know, other um, comorbidities associated with SCAD. But the big thing is when they're in the cath lab to try to stabilize them medically, uh, normalize the ECGs, get their pain gone and avoid placing a stent because stents in the long term um, term do not help. In fact, patients do worse if they've been stented. We have one more question uh, from uh, Rafil Mahjan. Um, I think he's asking about, let me read it out. Uh, for developing countries, how to go about OCT as because of financial constraint and support from the industry? Uh, uh, <laughs> That's not something that I can answer. Um, yeah. it, you know, it's, I, I find it a little disturbing that the cost of these devices are higher outside the U.S. than they are inside the U.S., while the cost of stents is the opposite. They're much cheaper outside the U.S. than inside the U.S. I think the only thing you can do is work with your industry um, colleagues and partners um, some people try to reuse these catheters. I do not advise it because the quality of the images degrade and I've seen them break because of um, they were not uh, because they were reused and they were damaged during the first use. Um, but the only thing to do is to talk to your industry colleagues and perhaps work with some of the stent companies um, to help you support you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Mintz. Um I think I will handle the mic again to Dr. Adil uh, to present the next speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Very interesting talk. Um, we come to the final uh, part of the presentation. Uh, Professor Kinney, uh, well-known, uh, world-renowned. She's the cardiac cath lab director in Mount Sinai Hospital, and she's going to talk, oh, show us some uh, interesting cases, no doubt. Professor Kinney. So this is a, you know, live in box, a live case uh, where we are doing rotational atherectomy and the complication of rot rotational atherectomy, how we managed, uh, especially of a circumflex disease. And at the end, I will take all the questions um, about how to do a complex uh, a left main to circumflex uh, rotational atherectomy. I'm going to start it now. Can you hear? Yes, we can hear. Okay. No, but the, uh, there's no the sound video. in the video. The video, no, still. I'm trying to see how to get the video now. I know you can hear me, right? Still. Yes, we can hear you clearly, but we cannot hear the video. We had sent this to you guys. Can you share it from there? Uh, let me see. Uh, Ziad? Hello? Yes, Ziad. Uh, uh, could, you, uh, could you please reshare your screen again with your audio? Shh, shh. Doctor, can you share the screen with your audio? With the audio. Okay, share the sound. Okay, I think I did not do that. And okay. before that, let me just bring this yeah, to the beginning. One, share the, yeah, I'm doing share the sound. Okay, share. Now? No. I did share the sound also. But I think there might be a mute on the video, uh, Professor Kenny. If I 
if I see. Uh... So, um, Kenny, I mm -hmm. think I, when I, when I had a problem like this and I had turned off my speaker um, on my Mac. I don't know if you're using a Mac or a PC. PC. Um, because for some reason, if the um, if you're internally muted on your PC, it does. But but you you sound you look like you're just talking right into your PC. Mm. Are, are you using a separate microphone or not? I am using a separate microphone. Then I you probably have the um, the video turn or the audio turned off um, on your PC. Okay. Yeah, muted. Yes, now, now, now try. Now we should, we should hear it. Or female present with non STEMI. Perfect. She had a lot of other diseases, as you can you see. You can hear? Uh, yes. HIV. Uh, and end stage renal disease presented with non acute heart failure and non STEMI. A patient had multiple medical problems and had a heart team discussion after the catheterization on a good medical therapy. They put patient on IV dobutamine and so, and we are going to show that angiogram, very significant left main disease, and more importantly, STS score. Because of this is the angiogram, uh, ej ejection fraction between 25 and 30 percent. And then this is the angulated, very calcific left main. As you can see here, 59 year old, very calcific because you're diabetic uh, and uh, and particularly the renal failure and angulated cirque with multiple lesions. And then go to the, you see very tight distal left main, almost 90, 95%. And uh, some moderate lesion in the mid LED, but additional lesion in the circumflex questions what to do. And uh, so this patient, our goal is to do an intervention of the left main because it had been declined by surgeons, has had a good surgical discussion, and uh, I was guided or any uh, complexes, whether we do I was or OCT, because of angulated, we thought maybe we'll not be able to get the OCT catheter in the beginning, but uh, anything is very difficult. All left main cases, we do imaging, whether it's I was or uh, OCT. So this uh, combination is strategy based on the LV dysfunction, and complexity is what uh, we have been using uh, algorithm. So this patient will fall into the middle category of 20 to 35 EF, complex PCI, high syntax score, high STS, extensive revascularization, no surgical option. So it's appropriate for Impala. So with that note, we are ready to... Uh... Yeah, so the question, if you had seen this angiogram right here, uh, we will, uh, the decision is, when the angio came from outside hospital, we thought uh, we just do the rot of the LED and cutting balloon of the circ. And uh, since both LED circ are uh, angiographically significantly involved, that we will do a double strand uh, strategy here. But when what we did the mean? angiogram here, it was 20, EF is 30. So we did uh, do, she's got heparin and uh, we have a single axis and a seven French uh, guide. Uh, so if you see, the impella is in. This is a VL guide. What kind of a wire would we choose? Seconds. So initially I tried with a fielder, would not make a turn. And then I thought uh, just to make sure that we, we uh, the, since it's polymer jacket and a hydrophilic tip, many times this angulated, though we think it will go, it may not go. We took a, a run through, which we know is a hydrophilic uh, coating at the tip, but it's not polymer jacketed. So that actually made the turn. So what you're seeing right now is a fluoro save where we made a turn with a run through. And then the next step is how would you get your uh, fine cross uh, across that wire? You see that? So that also is not a easy one. So if you see that, we did fluoro save. Yeah. So fine cross is the same. You have to do corkscrew movement and you keep advancing slowly from your you know, corkscrew movement on your right uh, hand and in your left hand you're advancing it uh, slowly so that way it will make the turn you see how um, you know multiple angles with it had to make a turn uh, it did make the turn and then we uh, uh, exchange it to the rotor wire so this is where we are with the rotor wire wire and once we know we had this much difficulty our original plan of 1.25 bar we're still going with the same plan of 1.25 bar and let me tell you suppose 
we were not able to get this in the first couple of minutes the wire that we angle it the next step would be that you want to take the catheter with an angle which could be either venture or super cross but i think that would be um of uh, you know more uh, i would say heroic here so if that we could not have wired the circ plan would have been that we will go and take the led that we will do 175 bar of the led many times significant lesion in the circumflex opens up when you do the left main to led and then we will be able to wire uh, the circ that would have the plan but right now since we are able to plan uh, our original uh, strategy we are just going with the 1.25 bar Good. with the rota pro we are checking. okay we are ready here 1.25 bar we we'll do so we actually in our lab we always do 150 only 150 uh, and this is actually about uh, you know the rotor pro console comes with a set 155 you'll know so so this is about 150 speed already uh, blood pressure is low despite impella so we get, need to get some additional medication you to pull back so while you are you know burying it i can ask uh, you know yeah. some comment from dr matthew yeah. good dr ronnie matthew is a very yeah. very experienced operator good. Uh, in india and so now, you know, yeah. of course yeah. he's the senior Start yeah. so dr ronnie any comments just quick comments while they are burying it yeah and keep changing the wire position in angulated one so because otherwise wire may cut ronnie is muted yeah we definitely need a lot of uh, Comments and advice yes, in this yes. particular case, yeah. Yes, yeah. See that? Now. Yeah. So now once it is no, we have to go dynamic like back. Yeah, yeah. Okay, dynamic. Yeah, come. Yeah. Go. That is a classic demonstration, Dr. Sharma, of a of a acute bend in the circumflex and how we are doing a rota. I, yeah. I quickly would have would have uh, would have been would have thought twice before doing the circumflex. No, we. I would have taken the LED first. Yeah. So not only that, the okay. bark went very slowly, but got stuck, yeah. as you see here. Yeah. yeah, while coming back, it has got yeah. stuck. Now yeah. it just jumped out. But the but key is that not only twice, we believe we thought five times in this case, the what to do. Mm. But there was no other option in this particular case, because even run through, I mean, went in, but fine cross was very difficult to advance. Very, very difficult. Yes. yes. So. So now we are ready we to come out now. I mean, I have the same Let's run through. I'll try so, to do side yeah. by side. If it does not go through, then so, we will go over the wire. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see so the what we have. He's uh, doing the wiring, Dr. Oh. Sharma. Yeah. Uh, let, we can have a quick discussion yeah. on uh, yeah. the impeller. So, this is so now, since we got a little dissection, as you saw the bird jumping, so we are going yeah. with the same fine cross again, and hopefully it will go. Although may not go with the rotor wire now, and then change it to. Exchange length, which is good. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Hold this wire. Let me show you the angiogram why we may have decided. Normally, if you've seen what we normally would say is you will go side by side. In this case, there's no way you will make a side by side. The entire Absolutely. circumflex, there's a wire bias as well as a, a dissection. So you have to go over the wire uh, and then change it to a. Uh, hmm? no, there's nothing. I think it is completely acceptable that. Changing it over a <clears throat> exchange character mm -hmm. is a better deal over here. Yeah. Because there's the, a big the, chance that it can go into yeah. the false. And side. also what you so, we always teach is when you the, have a calcific lesion, you go one to one vessel size. So we have a actually we have only two five. Two five, you know, twelve balloon we took. Yeah, right now Knowing short that balloon. It's really, yeah. uh, we have to make sure we have uh, there's a lesion uh before uh, that the uh, OM takes off. Now what I'll do is wire the LED, LED also. also. Put a run through so the I LED. I think what uh, in this situation, if everything had gone fine, we would have done the route of the LED. But right now, since we have a dissection of the circ, we will just wire the LED and. Uh, But recently, Good. I had yeah. to use a short Very one good. also, yeah. which helped. So, but yeah. anyway. So this was the fielder so, wire which we went into the LED. Mm -hmm. So now we this have a two five twelve. We have we have a two five twelve that we are going to the you know we have two lesions in the circ. Mm -hmm. We'll go there. And this is a non-compliant NC balloon, yeah. right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Dial it here first. Okay. Go. Okay. This is the 2.5.
if need to be many times, you know, you may need to have compliant balloons to make the turn. Go up. Okay, yeah. Go. Yeah. 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 We are going with a 2 or 2 12. Well, compliant. Uh, initial balloon was a 2 5 12. You see that? Would not make a turn. Yes. So let's yeah. go with a 2 or 12. Compliant. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so now there's dissection. I think the more important reason why even balloon is not making any turn is because of the wire bias. Wire bias Absolutely. and guttering can give us this kind of a uh, issue. Yeah. So there are yeah. two two close friends here: the yeah. tortuosity and calcification. <laughs> they just <laughs> yeah. yeah. So now you, you see that yeah. uh, we, this is Going a two or twelve there. balloon track. Yeah. So the, uh, Mini track. Uh, there is yeah. a comment there's from, a from, from Kevin. No. Yeah, Doctor. There is a comment from Doctor Kevin. Yeah, and he's good. saying yeah. that could you use anchor balloon in LED to get yeah. the LCX balloon. So that I is definitely a yeah. strategy. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. But now the balloon is in. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there's a question okay. from Dr. Yadav that yeah. you, you might need the guide lock. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Yes, so in this yes, particular yes, case, once we are yeah. get to that level, we definitely, but now you have the bifurcation. We need to address those lesions uh, before we start doing with the Gargila. But Gargila is ready. This okay. is the case. You'll end up in needing it, yeah. Okay, we go with a 2.5 balloon or bigger balloon now? 2.5. 3 or 12 will make a turn. Okay, so 3 or 12. Doctor uh, Anu is dilating these lesions so well. Yeah. Uh, Doctor Samin, there is a question. When do you prefer oh. rota stiff wire? Yeah, so rota stiff yeah. wire will be more Dr. so yeah. for real distal lesion, not angulated. It is going to create gutter and more importantly, osteal lesions. Osteal where your guide has to be a disengaged, particularly aorta osteal lesions. Okay. Yeah, go here. Aorta osteal lesions. So the rota extra support use it in about 10 percent of cases, no. uh, particularly in the aorta osteal and very distal. Now many times when you try to do, yeah, let's pull the wire. Yeah. Okay, yeah, good. So one thing oh. which we there, but I would probably just go and stand from the left main to the circumflex right now, and yeah. then go. only think about the LAD later. Or at the same setting as a tap. Okay. The question is 23. We have the Zion's uh, sky point. Uh, 3 o 23. Whether it can go or we need a guard. Huh? Yeah, there's something. If we guard then we can go with 28. But then you have to have balloon for the well. It's went in actually. Wait one second. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We have to cover this. I other way around. So we go all okay. the way down. Yeah. I think this is good. Okay. We have to stabilize this area because right now we are in a very crucial situation of the osteal circumflex. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, it's a 3 0. Uh, 23 right now, we know that it's not an appropriate size, 16 atmosphere. But you see the sky point with that angulated, it still make the turn. We yes, never made the yes. high pressure, uh, non compliant didn't make it, but this did it. And now we take this out, maybe a little go balloon distally, massage it, and then we come back and then. We do the various. Look at the pressure. Now take it up. Mm. Good. Good. Very nice. Thank I know that we have crossed our time limit. If you need to be, you can no, go. No problem. Yeah. Okay. We can. We can. No. No. We can continue for okay. five, okay. Nine, ten minutes more because this yeah. is a uh, big learning over here. Yeah. 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 But let's take the pot. To, we don't need the LED wire now. Yeah. Ready? Take the LED wire out. It's not going to help us. Okay. 408. 20 yes. atmosphere. Yeah. So ideally, you should go into the vessel, the main vessel, which would have been here through the LED. Uh, so, but this vessel, you see that it's a 40 left main. We have a 3 0 stand. You definitely cannot wire through that mm. stand. Yeah. Yeah, so Absolutely. then pressure, pressure. that's why I left that wire in the Good. LED. Uh, now let us rewire the LED and then take the wire behind it out. Okay. Get me a new field. Of yeah, wire. right here. Yeah, as you can see here, that's where we are now. Usually you don't see a um, trouble. So what happened is when we did a cutting balloon of the left main, um, you know, we were questioning, should we go into the hospital LED and do a cutting balloon, which we did not, because we didn't want two vessel dissection. We had a bad mm -hmm. circumflex dissection. Now you go and cut the LED, then you have LED dissection. So that's why we just did the left main to circ. 
So right now we are having some issue of getting a balloon also into the LED because of the calcium. So 2O balloon would not go. We are now gone with a 1.5. But 2O, it was not a the new balloon. Yeah, it was it's a used. Balloon. Yeah. Anyway, we are ready Let's with a like 1.5. So we'll have to go step by step. Yeah, it's a new balloon. 1.5, small. Right, new balloon. Yeah, new. 1.58, yeah, yeah, went through. So essentially you there have you to go gradual dilation. So mm -hmm. now we'll go with this one, then we'll go with the 2O. Get then we we'll decide. Get the 2O. Yeah, I'm seeing some comments from Dr. Kevin. So Dr. Kevin, at this stage, would you like to, you know, kind of uh, give any more okay. suggestions yeah. on uh, going, you know, with the plan which is being done by... Right? Yeah. Let's open it. Yeah. I got this, it in the sense case, the left vein yeah. is not well covered. Right. We'll do cool out. If you yeah. think the left vein is well covered, we'll just yeah. do a... Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. But this so could this be a point after case, this, you're yeah. going to image and then kind of make, you know, is that is that how you're going to determine your strategy once no, you do this, I once mean, you prep uh, the vessel? Uh, most of the time. Are you guys going to uh, IVS it or? Uh, IVS uh, would be a final just to see that it's well opposed. We would OCT, make a decision yeah. uh, angiographically. But let's say the angiographically so that, that we are done. So osteal circ, look at this, still not fully opened. There's a lot of yeah. uh, the men. No, no, no. But that's okay. It's not. It is, uh, it's that... Uh, Vessel was uh, dissected, I think what we have. We have to just dilate more. Yeah. Ba yeah. Good. So this dilate. is a 3.5, yes. Yeah. You, you guys have the coronary IVL approved now, right? I mean, yeah, we have that we have your... it now. Yeah, we have Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I've got OP and IVL, all else fails, then drill it. Yeah. So the, the balloon has uh, expanded very well in the... Yeah. Uh, yes. No, I was in more for the Oscar, yeah. Ostium of the left main. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. And, okay. uh, good. So I think uh, yeah, if we, I, if we I was and we show that uh, it's uh, well optimized, then we just do a tap. Yeah. The ostium looks okay. okay. Yeah. Okay, show okay. the IVAS now. Good, that's it. That's it. Yeah. So since we need the ostium, I'm uh, pulling the guide out. It's a nice expansion. So it's well optimized. Yes. Despite three O when we went with four O pot. No, but nice. Ready, OCT. So Austin looks quite well dilated, actually. Yeah, it looks very good. The yeah. Yeah. So it looks good. Let's have a look at the ostium. I thought it was a little under deployed there. No, that we can dilate. Yeah. Go back. Go back. Uh, show the ostium. That's your stent. That's your stent. Mm. No, see, uh, we are seeing the vessel distal to the stent. Yeah. The, the left pouch. Main now. A little small pouch. Yeah. That's what we are seeing in the angiogram also. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm. I think it's well opposed, except that I section. Uh, yeah. Nine. Nine. Wow. Wow. So this is a pressure ejector, right? Yeah. That's right. Yes. Mm. dissection. So there is a dissection just to leave, right? Yeah, uh, just by looking this? at it, we have a uh, very little uh, red dots, which means it's most of the mm -hmm. part of the stent is well opposed. So this is the distal edge mm -hmm. we knew. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. go a little bit uh, distal to that. Dissection. There, yeah. there, there. There is a yeah. dissection. I mean, the length of the dissection is long, but the angle, you know, the defini by definition, the angle is uh, shorter. So I guess taking thing one thing into a, a place, and we know how difficult. Uh, it is to advance anything in this case, we can leave that alone. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. We'll be fine. Yeah. But more important... Uh, come yeah. to the ostium of the circ. Yes. Is, 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 I think uh, uh, have you done the core edge? Yeah, I did. I did. Okay, show the ostium uh, to them. There is a big that curse fine now. There, there, is, the, there is the ostium. Yeah. Yeah. That's the calcific nodule. Uh, a lady yeah. from the 12th actually, And it is protruding calcified yeah. nodule. That's yeah. the nodule. Yeah. 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 Look at that. But no, question that, is, what that, to do now? No, okay. That, right now, let's decide with the LED. Yeah, three point five twelve, and put a four O balloon into the ostial for the tap. Okay, we have three point five twelve. Zion's sky point in the LED. And a three eh? five. Get yes. a new balloon. Three point five fifteen. So this is it. Let's see how it is. Then we can do the little bit of uh, optimization later. Uh, but everybody agrees uh, yeah. left main optimization is good, so we don't have to do anything more for left main.
just we have to focus on the osteal cell. The osteal cell. Osteal cell can osteal already. So for the tap, you see that we have the strand maybe like a um, micro. Little die. Point five. So it's sticking in the left vein. Because stand is at the dot, not inside. In synergy, it is inside. Here is at the dot. Little die again. Mm. Where is the zine? Yeah. Yeah. Ready? Okay. Go. Up. Okay. Go up with the stand. Yeah. Three, five, twelve. Sixteen atmosphere. Okay, down. So now what I'll do is I'll bring the SDS into the left main. No, 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 just five, four, five millimeter only. Yeah. Pull back a little bit into the left main, yes. But a little bit. Yeah, good. Yeah. Okay, now we do both. So basically classical tap. Go up. And this is a 3.5 into the circ. Good. That's yes. Good. Okay, down. Yeah. Negative. Down. That looks in, nice. Left into the circ inside. Okay. Always. Okay, yeah, good. now you can, circ you can go high. Go. Yeah. Okay. You can go 20. It's 3.5. Good. Shine. Uh -huh. yeah, that that looks very good. Cool. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much. So is that uh, video finished? Yes. Excellent. Outstanding. So. Um, I, you know, the, the, session, the, the event was really great, you know, we're starting from something general, taking to the cases and then literature review, then really ending with a very complex case. Um, as, uh, you know, tonight event, you know, supposed to be in a, a range in a different way, but we managed in last minute to make all my moderators to take the sessions and really, I really, you know, really appreciate all the speakers to give us, you know, time after their talk to ask them questions and uh, get comments from everyone. So that was really interactive. And uh, uh, Khaled, any questions? Because I can't see any questions here with me. And uh, either do you see any questions there in your chats? There, there, is, uh, um, there is one question, Victor Abdullah. Please go ahead. What say. is the case from IBL after Rota? I don't know what does he mean. Their question is that we should we have done IVL after rota of the circumflex? Possibly. I guess I, I guess what it, that's what he means. Uh, yeah. No. See, once we did the rotation lathrectomy, it was very clear there was wire, wire bias and a dissection of the circumflex. So in that situation, uh, we know uh, so because of the angulated circumflex, you go with a smaller bar, and uh, no matter we did all the uh, precautionary measures to avoid. Um, any kind of uh, forward movement of the bird, but still because of the way the circumflex takeoffs, uh, you still saw the bird, you know, went forward, uh, what we call, uh, which is, should not happen. But then when uh, it goes forward, it is uh, difficult or even to get the bird back uh, to struggle, what we call as a stuck bird situation where we really had to put a lot of force and get it in. So even when uh, the IVAS OCT you have seen, what it create is a gutter you know, dissection slash gutter. When you have that kind of a situation, then your uh, first thing you do is stabilize the vessel, try to dilate. You saw even the balloon was not uh, advancing. So you dilate, you, uh, you know, make sure that there's no progression or you don't lose the flow in that vessel um, and avoid any further, um, uh, you know, atherectomy, atherotomy. That's the reason I think uh, IVL was not considered, but I know more and more people are doing that and the literature is coming out with the word what is called as uh, rotatripsy. You know, you combine rotational atherectomy and then you do the, uh, you know, uh, IVL in large vessels because we know rotabar don't go beyond 2.3, uh, 2.15 is the max we use. So, you know, like with the discussion here is whether you have circumferential calcium, calcific nodule, you do one treatment with the rotational atherectomy and do you need to go, uh, depending on, uh, you know, the depth of the calcium, would this, uh, you know, sound wave break that uh, calcific nodule? There's a lot of, the, you know, discussion going on. But in this particular case, very simple. When you have a dissection, when you have a wire bias, and you know 
that that vessel you could lose it stop everything focus on the vessel you try to dilate and stent the vessel the initial plan was actually to do a double stent technique from uh, left main led to circumflex but once things go wrong and you we started losing the circumflex with the dissection we changed the plan then we stented from left main to circumflex then uh, we took care of the led with a tap technique yeah but i, I made, uh, clear yeah but I think like that even you can try the shockwave even after the stenting. We see some nice cases and the expansion found which should not occur after the stenting, but found. And then we did the shockwave afterwards. And then we see the nice calcium fracture behind. So that's one possibility. However, this case is calcify nodule making such an expansion. So very eccentric. So it may be difficult even by shockwave. You know, and the long-term consequences after stenting a calcified nodule are not trivial, no matter what you do. I think that's one of the messages of the last year or two in terms of the literature on calcium. Um, Though the shockwave, I know people are saying you can use it after stenting uh, based on what the shockwave, uh, you know, basics are, sound wave does not go beyond, uh, you know, I know people are using it in various things because it's just come out and uh, they want to try it in various different uh, cases, but ideally should be in, uh, um, you know, more severe calcific uh, lesion, moderate to severe calcium, where we are talking more than two quadrants of calcium if you're doing uh, imaging first. Yeah, you know, in the places where, you know, we, we have lots of education about imaging and the uptake of it is, you know, really still about 10 percent, even less than that, most of the places. Um, we know the importance of the imaging. We will learn from you, morphology, links, diameter, pre-stenting and post-stenting, looking for the dissection and apposition and, uh, you know, optimization of the, our stent. What about, you know, here we actually use most of the time nowadays DCB, which is that, you know, um, drug coated balloons, you know, even in STEMIs, for many reasons. How the imaging will help in that? Well, drug coated balloon is not approved for coronaries in uh, America. So I know. We don't I'm, have I'm a lot talking, of experience with that. I'm, I, we are speaking here in the Middle East. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, there's, there's just so little literature that I don't even know how to answer it. I, you know, I, I could go back to um, the balloon angioplasty literature, but there's no drug on from then. So um, and there really is very, very little literature. Um, I would, however, challenge you when you say we do a lot of DCB, where's the data that that is better? Because there is no data. Um, you know the data on DCB is very simple. I don't know what to I don't know what to do, so I'll do DCB. That's the sum total of the literature on DCBs. It's coming up. It's coming. You know, but it, it depends how you. It's, no, but it's not. It, but but if people are using it routinely, and I know I know places that do ninety percent of their cases with DCB, but there's no literature to support it. It's totally empiric. Yeah. yeah. Maybe that's the reason. I guess uh, Abdullah. Yeah, yeah. Your question. Uh, a lot of the stuff we look at post post intervention um, is looking at stent expansion, uh, stent apposition, which is not available in DCB. So I think the question yeah. is, uh, uh, I'm not sure that, that uh, imaging would be helpful in DCB. Well, no, you have to do the you have to do the studies. Yeah. To say to make a statement like that is unfair. And unreasonable. So, so, so I can tell you the literature on the bare metal on the balloon angiopathy era. E events were related to three things: the lumen you achieved, the residual plaque burden, and the severity of complications like dissections and intramural hematomas. That is balloon angioplasty imaging data. Will it hold in DCB? I don't know. Yeah. So, so, so no rule at the moment. Okay, can I have the maybe last uh, take home message from each of you just 20 seconds before we end this uh, great session. Thank you very much. Let's start with uh, Prof Mintz. 
Well, um, the only thing I'll say is that, you know, it's, it's great to connect. It's great to talk about imaging because certainly Akiko and I are passionate about it and been doing this together for 20 years. Um, it's hard to explain why the uptake is so low other than costs, but it's low even in uh, countries where it's reimbursed. Uh, and, and, has to, and I keep falling back on the issue of education. We've done surveys and people are simply, our interventionalists are not trained how to interpret and use images during their interventional fellowship. And if you don't learn it during your fellowship, it's hard to adopt it once you're in practice. Excellent. Dr. Kini. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, we have shown how to do complex cases and uh, where we come in is try to teach people how you can do this complex case in, in a simple uh, uh, way to teach the technical tips and tricks. So what interventionists are looking for are uh, three things. One, how to handle calcium. Okay, a calcium is an interventionist enemy. So, you know, learn how to use calcium. There are various uh, techniques, I mean, uh, there are techniques as well as uh, various devices. Uh, so lesion preparation is very important. And uh, imaging, I think um, it all depends. Is when you're doing a complex case, uh, you want to do imaging to understand is good. But uh, at the same time, if you uh, have a little complication, then your go, your focus completely changes. How can you stabilize the patient? and make sure you come out uh, with the, without uh, further uh, complication that you have a, a good flow in that uh, vessel. So, you know, there are several uh, live cases uh, which are already archived and you, have, you know, CCC live cases, you can go and see all the complex cases that we have. There is a lot of imaging also we teach, but I think it's up to the interventionalist uh, and they, um, how they learn from that. And you also know, we have created so many apps. There is an app for uh, OCT where uh, there's a description how to use OCT, the various um, how to, once you have image, how to analyze it, the, the quiz, a lot of things are available in that app and uh, it's a learning tool and, uh, you know, we keep uh, learning. Yeah, so, I mean, we've seen your uh, great apps, uh, Kenny. Thank you very much for that. So Dr. Alton, please. Um, I think that I would say that it's important to practice using imaging in simple cases for cases that we think are simple, um, and that we have a good idea of what we're going to find, um, or we're not expecting anything complicated. So that way, when, when you learn all the basics of the techniques and the interpretation, then you can apply them to the complex case, cases. So I would say practice, 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 and just keep going. Excellent. That, so that's a very good point, yeah. So I, 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 I started the imaging almost more than 20 years ago, and I'm still learning, including today. So, but I think always what I can learn is before looking at the image, you should imagine what's there, meaning the patient background tells you, and also the angel tells you, and what your change before, below, and after tells you. And then you should expect what you should see, and then you check. And then if that is much, it's good. But if not too much, that's the most important timing you learn more and more. So that's, I think that each case you maximize your learning. That's my suggestion. Dr. Benthani. Uh, nothing to add, but I think it was a great session that uh, we started about um, how we uh, look at the legions, how we assess the legions, how we assess the complications, how they can look for uh, by using the different modalities uh, that's available in the CAT lab. Uh, it's very important that um, uh, every uh, operator should be well uh, versed with the uh, available uh, imaging technique in his CAT lab. Um, and uh, I guess that's it. Yeah, Dr. Rayami. No, uh, nothing to add. Thank you uh, to all the uh, presenters. Uh, I, I've learned a great deal. Um, and uh, uh, I, I guess imaging uh, is important. We know that. It's just uh, the uptake is the uh, challenge. Yeah. Um, so if I could make just one last question, one last comment. Please. Uh, please. Um, one trick to learning is mm -hmm. to look at your cases a second and a third time because you mm -hmm. will see things 
that you did not see the first time. Excellent statement uh, to finish with. Thank you very much, all of you, for your great effort and your time. Thank the GIS, thank the organizer, ICOM. Until next time, have a nice time. Thank you. Goodbye. Stay safe.